Thank you. Good morning. So you made it in spite of the time change, which to me is not really a big deal, but some people it's a big deal. Um, where is Dana? Is Dana here? Dana, did you get all the lunches that I wanted ordered? Because we're covering 12 chapters today. So you're going to be here a while. There's no Chiefs game. There's no basketball that you need to see. See, Pastor only had to cover two chapters. Abram only had to cover two chapters. Brianna covered two chapters. I get 12. I got punished. <laughs> that, that's what this sheet is to help you. If you have the desire to do any research on your own, looking on your own, you can take a breath. I'm not reading all 12 chapters. We're going to go quickly through a few of them and hit the main highlights. Before I get started, let's pray. Father God, we just praise your name. We thank you that we just had the moments, the important moments to worship, because truly that's what today is about, what we're going to discuss, worship. You desire so much for us to come to you with an attitude of worship, to lay everything else aside, so, Lord, right now we want to lay everything aside. And, Lord, hide me behind the cross because I don't want to be the one that they hear. I want them to hear you and your words today. Holy Spirit, be with us. Fall down on this place. Pour out in our hearts and our lives today. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to first thank Seth and the worship team because that was awesome today. Um, the last song especially, but even the one before with our deliverer, our way maker. Um, because really that's what the Israelites in Exodus, this whole journey through Exodus, they're looking for a way. They're looking to be delivered. Um, we kind of gripe and complain if we get detained at a stoplight. For what, a few seconds in time. And here, 40 years in the desert. So, he tabernacled among us is the title. Um, go ahead and put up the first slide if you would, McKenna. See what you, okay. I faced a little bit, this is my little bit of humor, that I needed to have slides. So you got a slide. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm not a slide guy, so that's, that was my weak attempt. Uh, there'll be a couple more, but not much. Um, so uh, that was the best I could do. I'm not like David and Abram and some of these guys that can have all these slides rolling out. So if you get bored, just think of going down a slide and the freedom it gives you. So, you can take that off now if you want. Unless, well, maybe it will distract people. I don't know. Um, Exodus 25 through 37 is where we're at. The long journey. Um, it's all about worship at this point. They're in the desert. talked about the Ten Commandments last week. Well, in the process of the Ten Commandments, there's this journey to get a tabernacle. Um, that's where we're, we're headed. It's the tent of meeting. It's the sanctuary. I grew up in a church we called our, our place of worship the sanctuary. Um, never thought about it in terms of the tabernacle. Uh, but that's really where that comes from. Um, and it's, the important part is that he, Father God, tabernacles with us. Um, that's his desire. Um, the thing that is interesting for us as Commission Church, formerly Grace Point, is we were like the Israelites. We wandered in a desert for 13 years before we found our tabernacle. 
And this tabernacle is not like what they experienced. If you can play the video, would you do that please now? This is a rendering that I found on YouTube of what the tabernacle would have looked like. Notice the, the tent structures or the, the wall structure around it. I'm sure it's not exactly accurate, but it gives you an idea. The altar for the burnt offerings, the bowl for the priests to wash their hands in, and the holy of holies for the priests to be in. We don't have to worship in places like that today. We have a nice building. It's comfortable. We don't have the elements to worry about. They did. But that's what they had. And it was mobile. They had to pick it up and take it with them once they established having it. And that's inside. Notice all the gold. And we're going to read about some of that. Everything was covered in gold or bronze. And I thought, after reading this, and as you're watching still, I know it should be getting close to done. That's the Ark of the Covenant. Moses' tablets, the Ten Commandments, Aaron's rod, and a jar of manna. Those were the important three things inside. And that's, yeah, that's the end of it. But when you think about, I mean, we've all heard the story of the Israelites coming out of Egypt. Finally, Pharaoh saying, leave. And they leave. They cross the Red Sea. They journey for 40 years before they hit the promised land. But when, they, when you read about the tabernacle and all that it took to build it, and we're going to read that in just a moment, they carried a lot of gold with them. They really did kind of plunder the Egyptians. Uh, they, it was given to them. Take this. They took it. Gold, bronze, fabrics, acacia wood, a lot of stuff, a lot of building materials. Uh, instructions and plans were needed. In uh, chapter 31, I'm going to skip that far ahead. And there's a couple of guys in here that I'm going to say their names once and then I have another little bit of addendum to them. In chapter 31, now the Lord spoke to Moses saying, See, I have called by name Bezel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the spirit of God in wisdom and understanding and knowledge and in all kinds of craftsmanship to create artistic designs for work in gold and silver and in bronze and in the cutting of stones for settings and in the carving of wood so that he may work in all kinds of craftsmanship. And behold, I myself have appointed with him Oholiab, the son of... I and well, I'm just not even going to try that one. The tribe of Dan. I'll stop for a second and you can interject. Because those names were so hard to pronounce and I needed another slide. There is Ed. Well, now that's Nick. Where's Nick at? He's missing this. And then the next one is Ed. Super Ed. Because if you know Ed DeMoss, he, he could be Bezel. He has all those craftsmanship abilities and talents. He's our Bazel today. I mean, he's been working out here forever. And Nick has been right alongside helping him. So I will refer henceforth to these guys as Ed and Nick in the Bible. And uh, <laughs> Lord, forgive me if that's... But I had to make it to where I could read it. So I came up with Ed and Nick. Unfortunately, Ed's not here today. Maybe he's watching at home. But, um, so he appointed these two guys to be the leaders. And as you read through this, they dealt with the Ark of the Covenant, um, making that the tent of meeting. And then on through, it later goes on, and we'll speak about it, how 
those two guys then begin to train others. So when you're given leadership, when you're given abilities, in cra- whether it's in craftsmanship, whether it's in musicians, you don't just hold on to your gift and use it for yourself. It's for the family. It's for the body. You can help others. There really is a lot of joy when you know something that you're good at and you can show somebody else how to do it and watch the satisfaction they have of accomplishment that I was able to do this. So I'm sure even though Scripture doesn't talk about those attitudes, it was there when Ed and Nick were teaching all the Israelites the different things that were needed because it got specific on how to build all of this. But they taught others to do the work. And, of course, right off the bat, and I glossed over it, is that he was filled with the Spirit. We talk about that mostly in the New Testament. But the Holy Spirit has been there from the beginning because that's part of the Trinity. He's been there from the beginning. He was there in the Old Testament. He was with these guys. So Ed was filled with the Spirit then. God is present everywhere. But he chooses to manifest his presence strongly in certain places. Therefore, that's kind of the uh, importance of the tabernacle. It's not that God isn't with us throughout our day, wherever we're at, because he is. But there's something special about coming together as family. This is our tabernacle. Uh, Stewardship was a big thing. We talk about stewardship a lot in the New Testament of of, of tithes and offerings, but the Israelites were challenged to bring all that they had, the gold, the silver, the bronze, the fabrics, goat hair was one of them even, seal skins, all these things were used to make, oh, we still have Ed up there, uh, all of these things were, were made to, or brought about to make the, everything about the tabernacle. Uh, gold, silver, bronze, violet, purple, scarlet materials, fine linen, goat hair, ram skin dyed red, fine leather, acacia wood, onyx stones, oil for light, balsam oil for anointing. And it got to the point that the people were told, quit giving. Have you ever been in a church where they said, don't give anymore? I haven't. Maybe that's because it's a reflection on us as a people that we're not giving enough. That's all I'll say there. Leave that to your heart and the Holy Spirit how he leads you. We are to give. I think that would be awesome if I, got, I gave enough that God said, stop, you've given enough. It might scare me if I heard that from God, though, because that's not what I'm used to. I feel like most of the time I feel like I don't give enough. I need to give more. Well, the Israelites gave so much that finally God said, we got it all. Don't give any more. It's covered. The sacrifices of the tabernacle, um, you know, how it was built, there were dimensions. And Oh, by the way, a cubit, as referred to in the Bible, is one and a half feet. So if you want to do some math, because I'm not going to go through all of that and give you those dimensions, one and a half feet equals a cubit. So, and like the, the Ark of the Covenant was basically two foot square. That's how big it was, but covered in gold. So it was heavy. It was heavy. Um, and in that, again, I said the, uh, the Ten Commandments on the tablets were in that. Aaron's staff, which represented priesthood. The jar of manna, which represented God's provision for us. The Ten Commandments were the law. Then the other things, a part of the tabernacle, were the table and the lampstand. The priest's garments, and they were specific in how they were to be. The altar of incense. Now, chapter 32, if you really want to have, I don't know, most of us are driven by juicy stories or things you read on, online. You go on the computer and you see something that's just like, Wow craziness of that. Go to chapter 32 and 33 this afternoon and read that because there was great conflict. Moses actually talked God down. He talked God down. 
And then Moses turned around and he got angry. So I'm like, how did that work for you, Moses? You know? But God was so upset with the Israelites. He called us, called them stiff-necked people. Could he call us that today sometimes? That we get stubborn, stiff-necked, we're not flexible in that. What do you want, God? That kind of flexibility, not yoga flexibility, but spiritual flexibility. <laughs> Sorry. I don't know why I even thought that, but <laughs> yeah, I'm looking at you, sweetie. Um, yeah, she is, I, I should have told you she is, is a queen, and you didn't know it. At work this week was her birthday, and they gave her a crown and a sash and embellished upon her this week. So I had to tell him, well, I guess I have a queen in the house now. She went from princess to queen. Chapter, uh, like again, 32 and 33 are the ones, the big conversations between God and Moses. They were very open and honest, face-to-face -face conversations, even though Moses didn't really see God's face. The glory was too bright. The question for you and I today is, will we be desperate enough to seek God's face? Moses and the Israelites were desperate Especially probably Moses, because here he is the leader of probably a million people who were complaining, unhappy. They didn't have a shower available. They didn't have an oven and a stove to cook with. They didn't have any of the things we have today. It was rough living. Now, yes, that's all they knew, so they didn't know what we know. But still, it was rough, and they're in the desert. And it's not pleasant. Grumbling and complaining. Brianna talked about the grumbling. How often do we grumble today instead of getting desperate to seek God's face? And really, that's the greatness of what happened is that they got desperate enough for the presence of God, not for themselves. You know, they didn't look at each other at that point. And through God, there's promise. There's his presence. There's his wrath. But then there's his grace. And God wants us to have specific prayer. Not just, uh, I heard a sermon years and years ago when I was probably in high school about the different kinds of prayer. And the big one is the bless them prayer. Bless this, Lord. Bless that. Bless this. Bless that. What exactly does that mean? <laughs> it's kind of a very generic, safe term. But when you're desperate, you've been given a bad diagnosis from the doctor. It changes your perspective. God, I need a miracle. I need it now. They say I've got two days to live, two months to live. Two years to live, whatever it is. That changes your perspective. The Israelites, they had that. We're in the desert. We're sick of this. We need to hear from God. So God chose to tabernacle with them as he does with us. And he gave them direction, which that's really what discipleship is. Direction from God. We need discipleship today in our lives. So in chapter 35, that one I think you can throw up there. I'm going to read verses 30 through 35. Then Moses said to the sons of Israel, See, the Lord has called by name Ed, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, the tribe of Judah. And he has filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding and knowledge and in all craftsmanship to create designs. Again, this is a repetition of what we read in 31. So this is told several times. And he's also put in his heart to teach both he and Nick, the son of Ahishmach of the tribe of Dan. He has filled them with skill to perform every work of an engraver, of a designer, of an embroiderer, in violet, purple, and in scarlet material, and in fine linen, and a weaver, 
as performers of every work and makers of design. That's pretty talented individuals. But the talent came from who? It came from God. It didn't come from them. God gave that to them. And they had, what did they have that is often missing from us? Willingness. Here am I. Here am I. Send me. Here am I. I. I can step up to the plate. How often have you had challenges put to you? Maybe at your workplace. Oh, I can do that. I can take care of that for you. No, most people want to kind of hide a little. Please don't, don't, don't pick me. I want to hide. Hopefully they don't pick me. No, if you have the ability and you know God has given you something, don't be bashful. Step up to the plate. Because you're robbing yourself of blessing. You're, you're robbing the flock, brothers and sisters of blessing, because you each have abilities and talents that we all need. And that's why, finally, at one point, God said, quit giving, you've all given enough. Now let's get busy and build this thing. And so they did. In Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 8, For the law, since it has only a shadow of the good things to come, and not the form of those things itself, can never by the same sacrifices which they offer continually every year make those who approach, who approach perfect. Otherwise, would they not have created, or would they have not ceased to be offered? Because the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have had consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is impossible for the blood of the bulls and the goats to take away sins. Therefore, when he comes into the world, he says, You've not, you've not desired sacrifice and offering, but you have prepared a body for me. You have not taken pleasure in whole burnt offerings and offerings for sin. Then I said, Behold, I have come. To do your will, O oh God. And that's Jesus talking. After saying above sacrifices and offerings and the whole burnt offerings and offerings for sin, you have not desired, nor have you taken pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first in order to establish the second. Jesus came that we know, to fulfill the law. He came away. He came to be the sacrifice, to replace the bulls and the lambs that they had to do repetitively. They had to do that repetitively. But with Jesus, they don't have to do it repetitively. Um, In the, in the tabernacle, there was the first station. So I'm kind of backtracking a little, so bear with me. The altar sacrifice was for the animals. Well, how does that correlate to Jesus? Behold the lamb. That's what scripture says. The perfect lamb of God was put on this cross. And oh, by the way, the, last night... And I hadn't planned on using this, but I heard it, I liked it, so I'm using it today. The cross isn't the end. How many people who were at the cross the day Jesus was put on it, disciples included, family included, thought this is the end. They're killing him. What are we going to do? Despair, hopelessness was there. But no, the cross wasn't the end. It was the beginning. It was the beginning. Because he didn't stay on that cross. Yes, he died, but he didn't stay in that tomb. He was the sacrifice that made the difference, not the bulls and the lambs of yesterday. So God tabernacled in a different way with the Old Testament. 
and said, there's got to be a new way, a, a more proficient way, a permanent way. So he sent son, Jesus. Jesus rose out of that grave. So the cross was only the beginning, not the ending. And just like the tabernacle, though, Jesus' time on earth was temporary. He was here 33 years. That's a pretty young man. Real young to me. But those were 33 glorious years, especially the last three, because of how it changed the history of mankind. The beginning started at the cross. And because of the cross, Jesus shed blood, you and I have, we don't have to worry about going out and sacrificing an animal. We don't have to keep all of these rules and regulations. We have to have our heart right with the Father. We have to have faith that what he did was for me, was for you. You can't be bad enough, nor can you be good enough to not need the blood of Jesus for your life. And what we can do today is appreciate that God resides in our hearts, not a temporary dwelling place. The tabernacle was, was temporary. They set it up, and when they were ready to move on, they tore it down, packed it up. Made our tear up set down pretty lame, I think. We didn't have to worry about gold things and being careful in the weight. Uh, and we only moved them a few feet. So that was pretty good. But I'm glad those days are gone. Yeah, <laughs> glad those days are gone. In 1 John 5, 11 through 15. And the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. The one who has the Son has the life. The one who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. These things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, which is Jesus. The Son that you may know that you have eternal life. Now know that you have eternal life. This is the confidence which we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, it's the key part, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests which we have asked from him. So God hears you. He hears you. You don't have to even scream at him. Sometimes we probably feel like screaming at him. Sometimes we feel like he's not there. The Israelites felt the same way. But we have what they didn't have. We have the Holy Spirit with us everywhere we go. We have Father God and Jesus with us everywhere we go. They're all three with us. So the takeaways for today, well, we're getting out of here early. I'm making some people happy. See, I told you I was kidding you. The fastest 12 chapters you've ever covered. God has always desired with his peop uh, relationship with his people. That's always been God's desire. From Adam and Eve to us sitting here today in 2024. Relationship is what he wants. Not knowledge. Most of America knows about God, but most of America does not have relationship with God. Relationship. The second thing is we now have direct access to Father God through Jesus and the Holy Spirit. He tabernacles with us personally. I don't have to go into the priest and let him go into the Holy of Holies and do it for me. I have direct access. I don't care who you are, of the least important to the most important. You have the same access to Jesus. He gave you that. Do you accept that? Do you grab hold of that? Do you believe that? And another key element is that love and righteousness are critical in our relationship to each other and to the Trinity.
can't do it without love. You can't do it without righteousness. There is a cost. We have to be accountable. You can't just live like you want. We're called to live holy. And we can because of Jesus living in us. When we get out of the way and get behind the cross. Let's pray. Father God, even though today went fast through 12 chapters, a lot of it was repetition is how they built it. But the important part is that you gave them the wherewithal to build it. You gave them everything they needed to build it. They didn't have to go searching and go to a store and go, well, I think we're out of this. They had everything. Lord, so true is it today that we have everything we need. You've given it to us. All we have to do is but accept it. To be humble enough to say, I have sinned. I need you, Jesus. Tabernacle with me now, Holy Spirit. Walk my life for me. Let me get out of the way and let you lead the way. So, Lord, I pray that today for each individual here. If you don't know Jesus and you don't have the Holy Spirit among you, you need to do that today. You're not promised tomorrow. So, Lord, we pray for that right now, that you move on hearts, that humbleness would be there. This is a safe place. This is a place of love. It doesn't matter who you are. You can come here and say, I need Jesus today. Find Pastor. Find Abram. and Say, I need Jesus today. And Lord, we thank you that you chose to tabernacle with us throughout history, but even specifically today. In Jesus' name, we give you the glory. Amen.